Okay. I don't think we've gathered our quorum yet. Hey, I have one. I have one word of the day today, and this. I think you'll really like this word. B P I B A L O N. Epibalon. Epibalo. Epibalo. You guys remember Balo? Balo in its simplest form means to throw. But if you remember, we had para balo near near throw, right? Para balo. We had let me see. I got another. I need black. Para balo. We had diabalo. Balo. Let's see. Diabalo, which meant uh, diabalo. Um, uh, dia. What's dia mean? No? Eh, something like that. Uh, I'll get to that. Hyperba hyperbolo. Hyperbole, right? right. Hyper hyperbolo. So parabolo, parabola. Or a parable. Parable. Which we said was, by the way, right? No one says near throw. All right. This word has, can have two meanings, right? I mean, just if you take its antecedents. To throw near means I take this and throw it near you. But that's not what it generally means in Greek culture, or Greek thought. A parabolo, a parabola, a parable means a, a logos with a singular telos. So this is a logos with a singular telos, with one, one telos. Because remember, a telos can have, a logos can have multiple telos, because it's, a telos means, i draw the picture, a telos means the vanishing point on the horizon. So you can have multiple vanishing points. A hyperbolo means a logos with infinite telos, with infinite telos. A diabolo means a logos with no, Zero. Zero telos. Well, ha, ha, ha. What do you think an epibolo is? Now, epi, if you look, it's a primary preposition with, uh, you know, in relation, set, et cetera, et cetera. Super, uh, superimposition means it's, it's like so, um, uh, over on, over on, Throw. So I could take this like a parabola. I could say near near throw, right? Or I could say this would be like to throw yourself on, right? Throw on throw. Which, by the way, it, it's translated. No, look how it's translated in the King James and NIV, mostly in the King James. Beat into, cast upon, fall. Lay on, put into, stretch forth, and think on. Think on. In in this in this Greek look where we say that a, para, a parabola, a par, a parable. Okay, you can translate a parable as a near throw, right? Well, what's that going to get you in Chicago? I don't know. That doesn't mean hardly anything, right? But we have always taken the parable. To mean exactly this, that it's a logos with a singular telos. It's it's a it's a teaching. Well, I hate to, I don't like to use these words. A teaching story. Uh, it doesn't really gather it, does it? Uh, an Aesop's fable. That's better. A little better. A little better. Not too much better, right? But to us, a parable is that important? It's it's a literally a logical argument to some type of um, un un. Okay. How many parables do you ever hear that actually have a conclusion to them? No, no, no. What? Nowadays. No, no. I mean, in the Bible, in the New Testament documents, in the Gospels, do any of the parables have a conclusion? No stated. The end. There's no stated conclusion. These are obvious Greek parables. Par parabola, right? So I'm just saying 
that you can, yes, you can translate epibola as to throw yourself down or throw on, right? But that's about as good as saying that a parabola means to throw something near. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, we'll see this in the context, but I'm just pointing out. Look at how it's translated. And so you say, well, how sh well, remember, Diabolo, how is that translated in Matthew? It's not found in Mark, but you find it in Matthew. How do they translate that? Diabolo is? The devil. The devil. Yeah, the devil. Well, how do you get devil from Diabolo? I'm just saying. I mean, it, it's obviously, within the context, it is a logical argument with no conclusion, no, no telos. Well, Shazam. Just saying. I mean, there's there are some really deep things in this that you got to be cautious of because Greek Greek is a very concrete language in that sense, but there's a lot of depth in it that you know you can see within the context of these words. So the translator didn't do us any good by taking culturally powerful words and turning them into simplistic English. That's all I'm saying. It's like my favorite word, metapithumia, but I won't go back through that again. I did want to mention this. I was thinking about this. Okay, here's a way to compare the Gospels. You know, I was spouting off about Q, and I'll continue to disparage. Until they find Q, I will disparage Q because it's the most stupid in the name theory made by man or God. Okay? Because obviously Q does not exist, and when they find it, when they find any piece of it, I'll start thinking about it. But here is the way to look at the Gospels. Okay, so I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's say that I had, um, you guys may or may not be familiar with Socratic dialogues. You should be. They should have taught it to you because it's probably the most important literature in the Greek back when we were. But, you know, it's, they used to teach it to everybody, but they don't teach it to you anymore. For, I think, obvious reasons, they don't want you to know logic, and they don't want you to know, understand about Greek culture, society, or how to know truth. But, in the Greek dialogues, there's a thing called the Euphorio. And, Euphorio, anyway, close. I translated it, sorry, that sounds pretty bad. I translated it, I can't remember the... Anyway, it, it's an argument that's made about words. Words. And it happens to be a Socratic dialogue that... Plato wrote down, right? Plato wrote it down, and it's about words. How many Greek arguments do you think there are about words that the Greeks wrote? You think there's a lot or a little? A lot. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. And we have some fragments of some, but not a whole lot. Do you think that this, let's, let's say we have, let's say we have this one, that's one, you have two, three, let's say we have four of these, okay, arguments about words. A logos about words. Do you think that each of them have the same logos? The same argument? Do you think they're the same argument or different arguments? Different, different arguments, yeah. The, this would be different than this one. They're not the same, they're different. They're I don't know how to show different. They're different arguments. They're different. They're not the same argument. Do you think they might have the same conclusion? Possibly. 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 Yeah, possibly. Maybe, maybe their conclusion is similar. Now look at the analog to the Gospels. <clears throat> Do you think the logos of Matthew is the same as the logos of Mark? No. <clears throat> Which is the same as the Logos of Luke? No. No. Not even close, right? We looked at Matthew. If you guys are in my Matthew class, I've got some of those on the internet, I think. But the Matthew class showed that the Logos of Matthew, in fact, I did a, a comparison of the Gospels. The Logos of all four of these are different. But yet, these are the Q documents. These are the Kala. These are the, what do we call them? The Synoptic Gospels. What's the assumption in English? What is our assumption that we've heard for our whole lives? They're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah. 
a Greek reader would look at them and say, are they the same? No. no. They'd say the logos in them are all different. Now, the telos may be similar. The telos may even be the same. But the logos is not. That kind of reminds me of math, um, because you can have principles or theorems that can have different proofs, but it leads to the same conclusion. Beautiful. This is a way to think. Okay, I know. I know we don't like to think this way, but this is a way to think in Greek. Of course, this comes from our... Did you do math? <laughs> Uh, not in college, but... She did, but she does violin. You see, vi you know, musicians and math kind of go together, right? Right? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, this is this is the way you think. So when you, in Greek, the Greeks thought this way. You know, it's kind of foreign to us, right? When we got rid of geometry, we, we said, thank you, God, right? But the Greeks said, no, we're going to keep thinking about geometry our whole lives. And you go, why would you want to do that? Right? But, but what she said is precisely correct. That the Greeks, in looking at different telos, would try to find different theorems or, or logos to answer the same question. This is part of Greek, this is huge part of Greek culture. And by the way, what do we do when we find an answer to a solution to a problem? We never want to look again, right? I solved the problem. Forget it, right? And so, well, I'm not gonna. I'm never going to uh, give an excuse for new math or new math methods. I think they're horrific and ways of ruining your child. So you should take your children out of a school that teaches it. My personal opinion. But you can see, with even supposed new math and Common Core math supposed stuff, that you notice they use different methods to get to the same answer. Well, hopefully the same answer, right? <laughs> I've heard that 4 plus 4 equals 5 in Common Core, but yes, sir? And also to relate to different students. Different students can hear and may not pick up the concept of math in one argument, but you try it a different way and then it clicks. So. I would disagree with that in the fact that all children who are taught using the old methods, the old methods were memorization. It's like phonics. Like phonics. When you teach a child memorization mathematics, but guess what? We don't want poor little honeys to hurt their hearts and brains. We don't want them to feel bad about themselves, so we won't make them memorize. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't memorize your math facts, you're going to be crippled for your life. And guess what? Half the, well, not even half. 90% uh, of the kids graduate college can't make change for you. So if the computer dies on their, on their you know, cashier position, you will never get the right change, I guarantee. Unless you do it for them, and I hope you can do it. I'm just saying. You know, and the new math kids are going to be even worse because they'll be sitting there working for like 30 minutes right now a little thing, thing or diagram for you to figure it out. So just saying, you know, the world, that, the world is not better because of the new ideas. Yes, sir? Is the tello strengthened by, by the more of the arguments that you can get to the same conclusion? Ooh, ooh, very I nice. So, yeah. That is precisely correct. That is exactly true. And the Greeks, you know, that would make a Greek heart warm because that's what they would say. They would say, as a matter of fact, they might argue that, that some of these logical arguments or even theorems aren't perfect. But they would say that because they can achieve a similar telos, that therefore they may not be perfect, but they're close. And I would argue that especially in a, in a very long didactic, um, what we call a dialogue, you know, a dialogue theory, uh, the Greeks, can, okay, think about a Greek dialogue. We're, almost, we're kind of having a Greek dialogue to a degree. You know, I, I use the Socratic method. I think it's a wonderful way of teaching because even though it may put people on the spot and, and, and allow for quiet moments, you know, I'm not trying to elicit a, a specific answer out of your minds or your mouths. I'm just trying to make people stop and think, right? Give you an opportunity to think about things. One thing in the, so I'm kind of graphic. I think about pictures and they help me understand. Right. So the Greeks are kind of that way in geometry. I mean, that's what they're using it for, but it's, could it not be the same? The reason you have instant replay and they look at five camera angles, they're looking for they're different perspectives, but they're looking for an answer. True. Mm. Well, and they, but they all look different. 
Yeah, they're looking for truth. I, yeah, that's right. That is exactly correct. You see, well, you've been taught, haven't you? There is no truth. They were trying to tell me that, too. That's, that was, by the way, from a French um, philosopher. And I used to, you know, every, every year or so, I re-remember this French philosopher's name. He's dead now, and it's a good thing. If you ever read his philosophic stuff in translation, it doesn't translate well, and I don't think it's very good in French either. And I don't speak French. I'm just saying, the guy is in Cochet. He's un, not understandable. But he's the guy that, that, uh, that philosophized that there is no truth. And of course, uh, it ultimately comes out of, what's his name? Um, the really famous Christian philosopher. I'm sorry to say that. He, he has a wonderful theory of reality, but everybody hates him. What's his name? Um, not Kierkegaard. Um, more, uh, a little more modern than Kierkegaard. Uh, he, he basically proved God. What's, what's his name? Um, starts with a K, I think. You don't know, talk about Joshua Dow. No, no, no. I'm talking about a, a, a known philosopher, a uh, very famous philosopher. He basically proved God. The way he did it, uh, the, the, they hate him. He's anti-Nietzsche. He's absolutely anti-Nietzsche. And he's absolutely anti-existential. Uh, ex he takes the existentialistic message. I, I shouldn't get on this because this is too good of stuff. But just to say... There actually was someone who proved God. And that's one of the reasons that, that philosophy has really died on the vine. Was because once you... That's a, that was the purpose of philosophy in large measure. Was to prove God. Once, what's that? Emmanuel Kant. Emmanuel Kant. Yes, exactly. Emmanuel Kant is the man. He basically proved... His proof of God is par excellence and no one has refuted it yet. That's why they hate him. They hate him beyond measure. And he's anti-Nietzsche. He's anti-existentialistic. So anyway, that, that's a freebie. Okay, that doesn't obviously apply to everything we have here. Yes, sir. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke were also written to three different audiences. Mm. So they tried to adapt their argument to relate to their audience beautiful. as well and lead them to the same, same conclusion. That is beautiful. And what you've, that, that is wonderful because you've been listening to my class and or you're getting other good teaching. Because that is not what we teach. That is not we, what we've taught. Right? What we have taught is that the Christ, early Christians were what? Universal. Right. All the same. Right? All the same. And therefore, all these, all the Gospels are just the same. Right? It's quella. It's Q. No, my friends. What you said is precisely correct. That each of these was written to a different audience. And it appeals, and it appeals to a different person. As a matter of fact, I wish we taught the gospels that way. You know, some of you, the the gospel of Matthew, if you understood it within the context of a Greek logos to tell us, some of you would go, Matthew touches my soul because I understand its logos, right? Some of you saying, I mean, I like Mark. Mark to me is really cool because Mark is very simple on the on the surface, but hugely complex as you dig into it. Wow. You know, Luke is more of a uh, narrative style, which is more historical and beautiful history. But, you know, talking about, you know, the people, when you start digging into Luke, you start finding who he talked to, right? What a neat thing. There's some people who are historically minded. Luke would be just perfect. And then John, written to the Jews. I think, I think I've, I've proven more than one time that John was obviously written to the Jewish, to the Jewish community of Christians, period. The others have a little bit slightly different audience. But just to, yeah, different audiences, different logos, which may or may not achieve the exact same telos. So, beautiful stuff. So, I just want, happy, we'll see happy follow. I want to go back to four, uh, 66. I'm not going to go back and go into the detail. Remember, I'll draw the picture. The picture is this. So we have Peter... We have a, we have a, um, here's the barred gate, here's the gate of the house. And the house door is open, you, you remember, you open the gates in the day, you close the house gate during the day, or the house door. In the night, you usually open the door, 
You don't have to, but you can open the door and you close the gates. This is the way it works kind of in those ancient cultures. Now, Peter's warming himself and we have the slave girl come and she is obviously making her way here because all the other dupa heads are slapping Jesus. And here you have the, the guys in the house. And so they're at the door in the house someplace. He's warming himself a little fire pit or whatever they have, maybe a 55-gallon drum. That's why I was in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so she, she sees him, and Peter puts his hands in his pockets. No, he didn't have any pockets, but he wanders over to the gate. So that's, and she is obviously opening the gate. And I, I still, I'm not going to go into that, but I thought that's really interesting why they sent, well, Maybe that's the household, maybe it's the slave, whatever. I'm not going into that detail again. 66, while Peter was blowing the courtyard, one of the servant girls, the Podesky, a girl of the high priest, came by. And when she saw Peter warming herself, she looked close to him. You were also with that, with Jesus of Nazareth, literally. She lego. But he denied. He, he blathered. Not rero. Opposite rero. He blathered. Lego. I do not know or understand what you're talking about. That's interesting. I do not understand or know what you're talking about. He, Lego, he said. Do you think said, he's trying to be too cute by half? <laughs> like getting legalistic, putting Tony in almost, <laughs> by, by not well, theoretically coming right out and denying it, but coming up with a different way to just try and get out of it. I don't disagree with that. I, I think Peter, you know, I've said it from the beginning of Mark. Mark gives us the impression, I think Peter was in the military. I think he was either in the military or he was a in the he was a sailor. He was he was a a military sailor. He worked with the Romans, right? He wasn't a Roman, he's probably not a Roman citizen. He may or may not be. We don't know. Probably not. But he probably worked. And okay, there are a couple of options options if you're working with the uh, Roman sailors. Remember Ben Hur? He was a slave. <clears throat> So Peter might have committed a crime and then been a galley slave, that's possible. He might have been in one of the auxiliary forces. They did have some auxiliary forces. Uh, that would have meant, if he was in the legion, that would have meant he was a uh, Roman citizen and a legionnaire. But you notice the terms that Jesus uses with him when he calls him. He says, optio me. Right? He uses military terms. So I picture Peter to be this kind of big, chunky guy, you know, with a deep kind of commanding voice. And it's kind of like, you know, he's like a drill sergeant kind of guy, right? Who's always trying to, you notice how some of these guys, I see them all the time. They're always trying to lower their voice and make it quiet so they don't scare you too much. You know what I'm talking about? That's kind of what I see Peter like. And so, yeah, I see Peter here. It's like... Um, you know, well, can you imagine? Okay, Peter, I think Peter, I'm just making this up, but I think he was a pretty big, tough guy. And so a little, this is a slave girl. Is she well fed? No. Probably not. She probably have stuff. She's probably been a slave most of her life. She probably is half, uh, you know, the size of a normal woman because of, of uh, nutritional issues. We know this happened in the ancient world. So she's, she's probably carrying the slops out. And she may be carrying the slops out like this to go to the gate, put him out. And she addresses Peter. And that's an interesting picture in itself. Like I said, I don't want to get into huge detail. I just want to get to the next part. You know, I don't know, understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went into the entryway, the forecourt. He went here. That's when he walked in here. And guess what they left out of the, um, guess what they left out of the uh, NIV and the King James? Alector, Alector Phoneo, the cockroach. That's in the Greek, but it was left out of the King James in the NIV for some reason, in that on 68. And then 69. When the, so he watched here. Now here, she gets to the court, she gets to the forecourt after him. So this really supports my position that she is carrying something kind of heavy. 
because she ain't just walking, right? He walks to the forecourt. She gets there after him. When the servant girl saw him there, she legoed again to those standing around. This fellow is one of them. So she obviously got the gate open. And now here's the riffraff. Here's the, these are the guards. These are the, these are the servants of the priests, right? These are the hupateras. They're the subordinates. These are the servants and the guards. They're outside the gate. They're not allowed in. And she said, this fellow is one of them. Oh. 70, again he denied, this is where we stopped before, again he denied it, after a little while, those standing near Lego to Peter. Now, this was brought up at the end, and this is, this is a very important note. Does Peter appear to be under duress or threatened? There's no threatening going on here. As a matter of fact, because it says in the Greek, very clearly, after a while. So Peter, she asked him a question. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. He walks to the forecourt. The little girl, the servant girl, the slave, walks over here. She, gets, she opens the gate, gets rid of the swaps. And <laughs> you can picture this, right? Everybody is parked in front of the gate, except where there's the mark. She's taking human waste, in a, probably from the gynecium, and the first thing she's doing is she's dumping it out the front door. So she puts it down, opens the gate, and everybody better get out of the way, because she would probably love to hit them, right? I mean, if you're a slave, what other kind of fun do you have, <laughs> right? So, so she, she adds to the street. And they're running. They're moving. And then she says, this fellow is one of them. Because they're coming back, right? They're waiting outside the gate. They've not been invited in. You, you don't come in until you're invited in. Except Peter. Again, he denied it. After a little while, though, standing near Lego to Peter. Surely you're one of them. For you speak like you la Layla. You Lalo like a Galilean. You speak like a Galilean. Which indicates to us that what was he doing with the people at the gate? He's talking. He's conversing with them. Yeah. It's not included in Mark because it's not important to the Logos. Yes, sir? Two questions. One, it been, would it be unusual for this slave girl to be so outspoken and so aggressive in her, in her talking? And then secondly, that Peter wasn't threatened what was his motivation to deny his association with Jesus? I think those are good questions. And I think part of it may come down just from Peter himself. Um, Jesus was worried that the disciples did not, would not understand and would not continue. And I think the problem with Peter is not one of continuing, Peter wants to continue. Peter's problem is what? Understanding. That's been his problem throughout, right? Jesus told him flat out, I'm going to be, I'm going to be yielded up to the Sanhedrin. They're going to spit on me. They're going to beat me. They're going to give me to the Gentiles. They're going to yield me. Per didoma, yield me up to the Gentiles. And they're going to crucify me, and I'm going to rise again. And throughout the whole time, all the disciples could say was, Eh? Eh? Really? Did you have a question? No. Did you have a question? No. Well, I mean, last, last Sunday we talked and uh, kind of came to the possible conclusion that she almost like acknowledged it without any inhibition. And it was like, oh, you're that guy. Almost it like wasn't accusatory, really. Yeah. Almost like he was a co-conspirator and she felt all right to talk to him. Or the point was made, you know, the message is kind of proof that the message is getting out to other folks and people are starting to receive Jesus' message. Whether or not it was the disciples or not that were understanding, um, it could be implied that, you know, she was being witness to. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I think. And I think that is evident. And I said that about the trial. Remember the Sanhedrin trial? That Jesus was like, 
Well, the disciples may have been just talking with each other and talking about the football game, right? But at least somebody was listening to me, you know? And I think that this girl, see, Mark does not just throw, Greek writers do not just throw things in there. She isn't just a period piece, a piece of a story about this Jesus guy and Peter, right? That's not Mark's purpose. Mark's purpose as a Greek writer is always a logos to tell us. So why, why is this girl here? Of course, I believe historically she's really there. She was there, right? But the reason, there could have been 10 servants or other people that walked by Peter in that forecourt and said something to him. But the reason she was important in the logos is because of what you said and what we talked about last week. I think that she had seen them. She was a servant of the high priest, so she was hanging around the court of Gentiles. She may have been a Gentile. She was hanging around the court of Gentiles, and guess who she saw there? Jesus and disciples. And she, what she really wants to know from Peter isn't, you're that guy. She wants to know, tell me about Jesus. Right? And I'm sorry to put it, I mean, that is kind of a theological concept. But that's kind of the Jesus concept, right? That's the whole point about Jesus. People are, remember when Jesus sent him out, you are here, but when Jesus sent them out to talk to all the people in, in the Galil, right? And he told them to go into their houses and stand there with a big stick. And he, and he said, if you do that, then what's the options of the, of the householder? They can either beat you out of the house, which... With the stick, Jesus implied that he wanted them to be aggressive. But the option was that they would ask them to eat, right? Literally, in their society, give them the bread and salt and invite them in. See? So Jesus' ministry has always been this a ministry, I think, of um, an aggressive ministry. It's not a ministry of necessarily grabbing a person on the street corner and shaking them. It's a ministry of being there, listening to people, interacting. Yes, ma'am. As to the question of why he might have felt the need to deny it if he didn't feel threatened, he, <clears throat> as you said, he was trying to blend in, and he was sitting there finding out what was happening to Jesus. Even though he didn't necessarily feel threatened by this girl or anyone else around, he still they were all still witnesses, and they could rat him out still. I mean, right? He yeah. Could, still be found out. It's like he was spying, I feel like. He's a spy, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it seems like he followed in when they arrested Jesus and they all came piling into the court and he was just tagging along, trying not to raise any suspicion. They closed the gates, he's warming himself, and then they all switch over and they go in to start hitting Jesus as well and he's kind of left there on his own waiting for that gate to open so he can get out of there. Yeah, and, but even then, when it opened, he didn't get out. Isn't that interesting? I, I think he thinks of himself. And you know, the other question was brought up last week, which I think is a very pertinent question, is who else is with him? Because remember, I think it's in John, where isn't it John? John goes directly into the house, yeah. right? And that's how we know we have that information. Well, guess where Mark? You know, Mark may have been there. Who knows who else was there? And a reason, part of the reason for Jesus, let, let's say this. Now, Mark doesn't give this because it's not important to his fellows, right? But what if there are other disciples hanging around? Right? And he doesn't want to rat them out either. Just saying. You know? And I suspect the girl noticed him because, remember I said he's probably big and burly? Mm -hmm. He's probably bigger than the average guy. Yes, sir. I think part of the... Difficulty I have too with it is I already know the end of the story, so I'm putting all the pieces together in hindsight. But when Peter goes in there, he doesn't. He knows his group of people took Jesus for Jesus for some reason, and he has no clue why they're taking him or where they're going. So he's following along. So he's trying to figure out what's happening, and that's we know that the, the process is he's being tried and they're determining that he's. But I don't think Peter knew that was what was about to happen in the situation. So that motivation too is he's he's trying to get information <coughs> on the spot there. So 
Well, yeah, and, you know, the reality is, I, I don't remember. Jesus told his disciples over and over again, "I'll be yielded up to the Sanhedrin, this, you know, to the elders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They will, you know, find me guilty. They'll beat me. They'll give me to the Gentiles. They'll crucify me, and I'll rise again." How much that do you think they believe? I think they all wanted to say, say it isn't so. Yeah. They didn't want their leader to die. Yeah, la, 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 la. They didn't understand. Well, it doesn't make any sense because nobody's ever done it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the number one reason it doesn't make any sense, has Jesus done anything that deserved death? No. No. Under the, Okay, the Romans are not idiots. Look, if you go around killing people for no reason, I mean, even somebody will notice that, Right? In a civilized society. And then what do you have? You have a rebellion. And if you have a rebellion, guess how much taxes you get? <laughs> Zero. So, you know, the Romans aren't stupid. The Romans want tribute. They want tax money because they got to build these, you know, things in Rome and wherever they else they are. And they've, they've got, look, the Roman legions are all over the place, right? And their budget isn't much better than ours. So they got serious issues. Plus they got bread and circuses to pay for. So, look, the Romans do not want rebellion. The Romans want people to be in peace. They want to be prosperous. They build roads. They build aqueducts. This is what they do, right? And so Romans just don't kill people willy-nilly. We'll see this in a moment. Now the Sanhedrin might, but even under Jewish law, they're not supposed to kill people willy-nilly. If you're a slave, you have worries. Whether you're a female or a male slave, you got real worries. Because I think Stephen shows us, I think Stephen was a slave. That's why they croaked him. He didn't, he, he didn't go to trial at all. They just killed him. Because a slave had no rights in those cultures. Now, they were supposed to have rights in Jewish culture, weren't they? But you just don't kill people. And so when Jesus said the Sanhedrin were going to try him, what, are they, what do you think the, the disciples said? He'd be Acquitted. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they may have thought they may have thought that maybe Jesus wants to start a rebellion. I mean, really, he wants to become a zealot leader and put on, you know, in my book I had him with blue shawls on because that was their identifier of themselves and go get some weapons. And they probably were saying when Jesus told them take your staves and go talk to the people of the Galil, they probably were like, oh yeah, yeah, now Jesus is going to do something illegal and now we're going to have a reason, right? And he didn't. So they may have taken it, they may have taken it that, okay, at some point Jesus is going to go from a semi-peaceful dude to a guy like maybe John the Baptist, right? Wearing leather armor. He didn't have a sword, but he wore leather armor. Hmm. Maybe Jesus is going to put on his leather armor and get a sword and we're going to go to war. Yes, ma'am. Since they'd seen him do miracles and they knew he could probably get away from Yeah. So well, why, why should he ever be subject to any powers? Because he could always pray, pray, uh, do a miracle. And that's, and that's the amazing thing of paradidomai, to be yielded up. He never says that he was captured, you know, arrested, la, la, la. He was paradidomai. Now, in a moment, we'll see him bound, which is very interesting. We'll talk about that. Anyway, so... Again, he denied it. Now, now, Peter's cold. He's out with the riffraff. These aren't the subordinates. These are the servants of the subordinates, and they're not invited in. You know, I, I just, I love this picture. You can see this girl, right? Malnourished. Her only fun is, like, trying to hit him with the slops. She's probably, she's going to get her, her breakfast, she's hoping. Maybe it'll be something warm. And you, can you see her? Can you see her? The only way you're going to get in the house is if who lets her? She, she, and she's not probably allowed to invite him in. So she's like, she's in control. This little slave girl's in control. They can't come in. The riffraff have to stay out. Peter's sitting over here. There may be other people around in the, you know, in the court, but she's there. And so he denied it in 70. After a while, those saying near said to Peter, Lego to Peter, surely you're one of them, for you speak like a Galilean. 71. He began to call down curses. Now, it's not exactly what he did. He anathematized. He vowed under penalty of execration. 
He vowed under penalty. He didn't call down curses. He vowed under penalty on himself, and he om nu'u, made an oath to them. I do not know this man you're talking about. Now here is an irony. What did Peter just do? What is ironic about what he just did? Under Jewish law, if you vow under penalty of execration, that literally means that if what you say is not true, you can be executed. And he made an oath. Now, number one, Jesus told him, in accordance with the law, by the way, not to make oaths on the heaven, on themselves, on the temple, on God, or anything, right? Isn't that, that truly what, do not take the Lord's name in vain, do not swear faith, false oaths? No, do not swear upon those, but not, don't take the Lord's name in vain means do not say the name of God. According to the Jewish Jews, that means do not say Yahweh without reason. If you have reason, you can say the name of Yahweh. Matter of fact, modern, a lot of Orthodox Jews don't even say the name of... Yeah, they write like this. And a lot of early texts, you have basically this. In Greek. And this. Theo. God. Because early Christians were Jews. Tinhoros. And, er, and they did not say that. Matter of fact, Jehovah. No, I can't write it. Oh, uh, J, whatever. Like J-W. Yeah, something like J. Uh, I can't, anyway. The, what do the what do the vowels of Jehovah's make? Remember? Adonai. The vowels of Jehovah are Adonai. So they would use the word Adonai instead of Jehovah, using only the vowels. I didn't I didn't prepare that. I've got that I've taught that over and over again. That's so important in Jewish thought. So the second commandment is do not say the name of God. That's what they translated. It's not making oaths, it's not doing anything like that. Because to make an oath, you have to say the name of God, right? You have to. I mean, that's part of the, that, by the way, that is part of sympathetic magic. That's a whole different sphere. I've talked about that before. So, you know, the big deal here is that he just made a curse that under Jewish law, and remember the other irony? These guys were hitting him, hitting him, which under Jewish law, that's striking. You can be put to death for striking. You can be put to death for making an oath. Basically, this is a false witness. Right? So anyway, beautiful irony. But by saying that he didn't know him, he kind of took away the reason for him being there. To a degree. Well, I don't even know this. Well, what is he doing there? He says, I don't know this man you're legoing about. Okay, what are they doing? They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. They're having a dialogue, right? They are having a dialogue, and who's sticking his foot into their dialogue? Peter is messing up the dialogue. What did Jesus want Peter to do? Control the dialogue. Testimony. Lead them. Lead them. He, he asked the disciples, right before he was taken, right before he was paired in Oman, he said, lead. And guess what Peter's doing? He's, he's taking a staff and sticking it in the gears of progress here. The, look, I think that girl really wanted to know about Jesus. I think the riffraff at the thing wanted to know about Jesus. Now, these guys want to know about Jesus for the purpose of... Building a case against him. Yeah, building a case against him. But I think these guys, they want to know about Jesus because... It's Jesus, right? Is this guy the Messiah? Guess who he's... Look, guess who that Jesus guy has been insulting and um, uh, logically beating up on the whole time, right? Every time he's in the temple. I mean, all these guys are around, right? And every time he's in the temple, what is it? what do the, the uh, priests and the Levites and everybody look like? Cool. Just idiots. Yeah, they're idiots, right? And so... They want to know about Jesus. And this poor little girl, who's basically only fun is throwing slops, right, and eating lunch, eating her breakfast maybe, 
She went about Jesus. Just say, I, I, I think I think there's beauty. There is such beauty in this. Now watch what happens. 72. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word. He literally remembered the rima, the rima, the utterance, the rima. Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he epibalo. He epibalo and cleo. He wailed aloud. He epibalo. Now here's what I want. In epibalo, they translate it for us as he threw himself on the ground. Right? In, if it is an epibalo, what do you think an epibalo means in the context of a parabalo, a diabalo, a hyperbalo? What do you think it means? An epibalo, within the context, is a logos with a pathetic, a pathetic telos. What's a pathetic telos? Not very strong. An emotional. Uh, Pathos in Greek, and, and I know pathetic in English means you're pathetic. I'm sorry, I don't like that definition. Pathetic in, in English also means pathos. It means emotion-driven. And so when you write about a pathetic character, a pathetic character is not one that's pathetic, it's in bad. It's a person who's full of emotion or creates emotion. So an epibalo, as opposed to a parabolo or diabolo or hyperbolo, is a telos that produces an emotion. And so guess, look at the emotion we got. He, I don't think he threw himself on the ground, although that could have been an effect of it, right? That's why the Greek writer would use this word, right? Instead of using another word for throw yourself on the ground, he used epibalo to indicate to us that Peter came to what? Realized it. He realized, yes, exactly. He realized the logos that Jesus was getting to him. He realized at that moment that he missed his greatest opportunity. And maybe, you know what? Let's see what it says next. After he gave up his man card, then we get the next part. Now, if Peter really had his telos experience, what do you think? Mark doesn't need to tell us the next. What's the conclusion? What will be the conclusion? Peter wants another opportunity. Well, what did he do right then? He told them. Yeah, yeah. I think, see, Mark doesn't need to tell us. Because in the Greek, that is a logical conclusion. Okay, you're standing there. People are having a dialogue. You suddenly, the cock crows, and you go, and you give up your man card. You have a realization of a pathetic tell us, and you go, ah! And what does everybody do? What? What's, What's, wrong? Like What's wrong with you? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And and now, you know what else a pathos, a pathetic conclusion, a, a pathetic telos, what does it do to other people? It stirs them up. Yeah. Yeah, it gets them emotional. Mm -hmm. it gets, and in a culture like this, if somebody goes, ah, you know, immediately the people are coming and saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? Right? They're having a dialogue. The unstated telos of this is the next step that we forget or miss in the English is the next thing is Peter is now telling them about Jesus. And that is the point. Because uh, Mark doesn't need to tell us that, right? It's an unstated telos. It's obvious to a Greek reader. This is a problem that we have in English in reading these texts. is because when we go through it, we, we want everything, right? And if this were a modern novel in English or a modern history in English, guess what the writer would tell us? Then Peter sat and talked with the people until the sun went down, right? Just saying. Now let's, let's see if we can get a little bit into the next part because the next part, very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law, this is 115, the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. Now, I want to point this out. People have pointed out that they made their decision at night, but they didn't. 
So however you want to see this, this they did follow Jewish law in this. That it was not an illegal trial. They may have had an illegal trial with Jesus, and according to Mark, all the Sanhedrin were there. According to the other guys, the hole was not there until later. But it says specifically that very early in the morning, which means after the sun rose, the chief priests and the elders who teach the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They, and here's the first time. They bound Jesus. Under law, you can't bind people unless they are guilty of something. They led him away and paradidomai him over to Peter. There's nothing in here that's special except paradidomai. The point is they put him up. But look, Jesus yielded himself, right? The disciples yielded Jesus. Judas yielded Jesus. And the Sanhedrin and the priests just yielded Jesus to Pilate. I think it's very important to see this train of events. It wasn't just, oh, they went and caught him. Jesus yielded himself. The disciples yielded him. Judas yielded him. And the, all the Sanhedrin, all those dudes, yielded Jesus to Pilate. But this is really the first time before they took him, but now they bound him. And by the way, the word bound is dulo, duo, which means to enslave, to capture and enslave. So, in two. And look, I, I love Mark. Mark does not waste words. Because, okay, this immediately tells us something. Because the first words out of Pilate's mouth are, are you the king of the Jews? Operateo, Pilate. Operateo. Operateo means to ask or inquire or seek. He basically is, this is not, he's not Greek. He's a Greek speaker, obviously, but he's not Greek. He operateo. Remember, the different way of speaking was a, um, a what is it, Enedesco logos. It was uh, ask in a logical fashion. But he doesn't. He opened tarot. Basically, he's, he's requiring an answer from Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Here's Pilate. Pilate's waiting. The first thing he wants to ask is, are you the king of the Jews? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can just see this. I mean, just picture this in your mind. You know, Pilate didn't say, uh, according to Mark, Pilate didn't say, hey, how you doing? How's life? How's works? You know, what's up? How's your wife? How's your kids? Right? The first thing he says is, are you the king of the Jews? I mean, I think this is really important. We miss this. It's like right in there. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, Legos, Legos. Yes, it is as you say. This is not an insignificant thing. Because remember I told you, I told you when we had the high priest... The high priest statement is, is the climax. The climax of the Logos is when the high priest asks him, are you the one, are you the Christus, the Son of God? And when he says that, Jesus says, yep, I am. Ego imi. Ego imi. I am. He used based the name from God. I am the Son of God, the Christus, the Son of Man. Before he had said to Peter, the answer was obvious. Who do you say that I am? And Peter should have said, you are God. But Peter said, you are the Christus. The high priest at the climax basically pronounces Jesus to a degree to be the Son of God. Jesus, and Jesus says, Ego imi, I am. So remember what's the next step? The Son of David, King of the Jews. Guess who the King of the Jews is right now? Herod. Herod. Herod, Herod uh, not a group by Herod the uh, Antipas. I think it's Herod Antipas. Anyway, it's not the Herod. It's one of the Herods, okay? And he's only over the Galil. But he's there. He's in Jerusalem right now. So that Herod, Henry Antipas, is Antipasto, right? Herod Antipasto, Antipas, is there. And he is the king of the Jews. But guess what he is? He's an Edomite. He's Edomite. 
His family was forced to convert under the Maccabean era, and his, he became the king of the Jews by decree of the Romans. Is he a son of David? No. Oh, no, he isn't. He can't be. Well, he could have been. One of, you know, David, right. Solomon had a bunch of wives. Maybe he had a bunch of Edomite wives. I don't know. There may be a lot of sons of David out there we don't know about, right? But, no, his, he, he had no lineage in the house of David. Is there any sons of David around? Maybe a few. But Jesus is the only one we know about, right? So to be the king of the Jews, you're supposed to be the son of David. You're supposed to come out of the lineage of David. Oh boy, so, Pilate just said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus didn't say, ego emi. He gave him a Roman answer. You see the difference here? If, he, if Pilate had been Greek, he would have said, ego emi. He's not, he's Roman. So he says, yes. He says, yes. It is as you say. Notice his words. Who just pronounced Jesus the king of the Jews? The governor. Pilate. Pilate just did. Pilate pronounced Jesus the king of the Jews. And by the way, what is really important about this is who made Herod Antipas the king of the Jews? The Romans did. Look, we don't know the culture. We miss a lot of this, but it is beautiful in its execution. Mark is so remarkably beautiful in the way that he puts this forward. Because Herod, this is like the tricks we have when you're in uh, prisoner training that the military gives you. They have tricks that the enemy uses to make you pronounce things that you never would want to pronounce. They do it. This is a trick, guys. And Jesus just made... Pilate, pronounce him king of the Jews. We'll talk about it next week. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray that you look after us this week. In your name we pray, amen. And he made the high priest, calling the priestess and the